in Ed Bolian fashion, you have to be ready to move immediately. So it's been a while since uh, anybody's tried to involve me in a really good scam attempt, but every now and then it does still happen. And I was minding my own business one Saturday morning, doing some yard work, and I got a call from a Dallas number. And I proceeded to get about four more calls in short order. I assumed it was just a overzealous trucker because they usually pull that strategy when they're trying to get a load. They call and call and call and call and call. And of course, when you need to get a hold of them, you never can. But uh, man, they are readily available when they want business. I finally picked it up and uh, turns out it was a nice southern gentleman who wanted to sell me a car. And he said he got my name from Ross. Yeah, hey Doug, this is Paul. Give me a call back. I run across a couple old cars and, and uh, Ross wanted me to give you a holler. See if you're interested in them. Bye. Well, that was a unfortunate name for him to pick if he was trying to establish credibility because I only know two Rosses. And one of them is a local detailer and the other one serves with me in youth group. I don't think either one of them would have given my number out for a couple of cars for sale in Texas. This guy wanted to sell me a couple cars. And one of them was a, I think it was a 79 Porsche 930. And the other was a 60s or 70s pickup truck that I'm sure Rabbit would have been happy to make a mint on. He starts talking about them and saying they're coming from the estate of this lady or you know, they were her husbands or something like that. For some reason, she had to dispose of them in short order. And I guess that she didn't really know what they were worth. And she was looking for a couple thousand dollars for each of them. At this point, I figured, well, this is probably too good to be true. So uh, my tone didn't change at all because I wasn't excited. So there's no need to hide my excitement. I figured if this is for real, then it's going to be a long shot and Richard Rawlings will probably get there before I do. But I kept the conversation going because you always keep the conversation going until it proves to not be worthwhile. You know, I, I start asking him some questions about the condition and just kind of say, okay, well, you know, why, why are you representing these? What is your position in this whole transaction? And why don't you just buy them? I mean, all you'd have to do is lay out a few thousand dollars and you could easily make tens of thousands. You know, I don't know what the truck was worth, but I'm sure it was more than they were looking to get for it. I said, you know, sure, I'm, I'm interested. I'll, I'll be happy to buy the cars. But his excuse was that, you know, he, he didn't have the cash. He had just bought a few other cars um, and had his, you know, I've, I've got my assets tied up, you know, one of, one of those types of things. And he just wanted to find somebody that he could, you know, parlay this deal onto and, and make something along the way. I said, okay, well, what are your expectations of how much you'd like to make? Because obviously she may be sleeping and not know what these cars are worth, but you do. So I'm not going to pull the wool over your eyes. What are you trying to make? And he's, oh, you know, if I just make a couple thousand dollars, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I was like, well, you're an idiot because anybody that would make a couple thousand dollars when they can add a zero is like, why would you do me that favor? You don't know me. I mean, Ross told you to call me. So you could call anybody else and, you know, I, I don't care how much you make. You can make $20,000 on me if I'm going to make some money on it too. So, you know, it, it kept getting more and more fishy, but I just you know, decided I'll play along because if it does turn out to be real, then I'll kick myself for not. So I said, okay, you know, that that's fine. I understand. I said, listen, I, I've got cash. I can front the whole thing. You just let me know where to be. I said, I can fly down. I'll just bring greenbacks and just do this, you know, whatever it takes. Because I didn't want to give him any stumbling blocks. You know, when a deal like this comes along in Ed Bolian fashion, you have to be ready to move immediately. Now, my only caveat was, hey, I need to, to see some proof of ownership or something. Get me VIN numbers, pictures, anything. And uh, this is where it started to kind of fall apart and the excuses started coming. So he goes, oh yeah, well, you know, I've, I've been over, I've seen the cars, this and that, but uh, you know, we can't, we can't get them out of there until they're paid for. And I go, well, yeah, I wouldn't let cars leave my site until I had the money. 
So I said, okay, well, how do we pay them? He goes, well, they're, you know, her, I'm dealing with a notary and, you know, he's by the book and he'll make sure that everything's done correctly and this and that. I go, that doesn't really concern me. That's not a notary's job. Like they just notarize a signature on a title. I'm like, I'm a notary too. Who cares? I'm like, I don't care about this person over here that's going to make sure everything's transacted in a trustworthy manner. I said, just get me some real information, pictures, title, anything, because I'm not booking a flight unless I know that there's cars at the end of that flight. So he said, okay, well, you know, uh, I'll call you back in a little bit. Okay, no problem. So I go back to yard work and maybe an hour later he calls again and I didn't see it ring, calls, calls, calls. I mean, like five more times, leaves two messages. So I call him back and said, all right, what's the scoop? And it was more of the same. Just, oh, well, you know, I, I can go over there later, but, you know, we've got we've to gotta get some money to her before she'll let the cars go. And I said, okay, did, did you hear what I said? I said, I've got the cash. Get me proof of ownership. It's all you got to do. Just, just show me a copy of a title or a VIN number, anything. At this point, I pretty much know it's not legitimate, but I'm playing along just for the entertainment factor. I'm doing yard work. What the heck else do I have? He keeps along the same lines, and, and he finally goes, well, you know, let me let me call you back. I'm, I'm at the, the check cashing place. I got I to gotta go in and, and get my money. And, and during the course of the conversation, too, I kind of pushed him on, on who he was and who this Ross guy was. And I was like, what's Ross's last name? He's like, ah, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really remember. I'm like, hmm, like, is he a trucker? He goes, yeah, yeah, he's a trucker. We're, we're both truckers. I haul cars, and that's how I know him, and this and that. I was like, okay, well, that's plausible because I do sort of know a Ross that hauls cars, but he doesn't have my number, so whatever. I mean, I, I should have come up with something totally ridiculous because you know I was feeding him an answer to which he could say yes. And I should have been like, you know, who's Ross? He, Gigolo? But my mind wasn't working that quickly that day. This wasn't the first time that a trucker had tried to sell me cars. I mean, truckers certainly have access to a lot of vehicles because they're always picking up and delivering to private collections. So a smart trucker would get into brokering vehicles or at least, you know, making connections for a commission because they have all these guys' addresses and direct contact information and what they have in their collection, certainly. But usually you know that they're legitimate because the people actually want too much for their cars. But this was certainly not the case. There was no car in front of me and the number was too good to be true. So I'd written this guy off at this point, but he calls back one more time and I pick up and interested to see what the, the latest excuse is for not being able to produce, produce any actual information about these cars he's selling. And he goes, so... How quickly could you get your hands on $265? I'm like, this just got good. Given that I offered to fly down there with cash for the whole shooting match, uh, yeah, I can. I think I can come up with $265 in, in pretty short order. Why do you ask, pray tell? He goes, well, Sam, I went to the check cashing place and, you know, they charged me 7%, which I, I wasn't expecting. And so... I just need to cover that uh, so I can pay this lady and then I can get you the information on the cars. Let me go over, rewind, replay what I said before. I don't send anybody any money until I have information on the cars. I don't, I don't know if you, that's hard for you to understand, but I'm not paying somebody $265 in order to get information on cars, which I know doesn't exist in the first place. And furthermore, if you're going to try to scam me, don't use that you need the 7% to cover your check cashing. Like, just come up with a round number. Like, here's my fee, which is $1,000, to introduce you to this lady. That would at least be maybe plausible, and, you know, some other idiot might fall for it. But, uh, no, he needed, he needed the money to cover his check cashing commission. So, that was probably the most humorous and worst scam attempt ever that I've seen. Going somewhere in a hurry, ma'am? Let me explain your options. Never mind, I got this. TheTicketClinic.com